All right. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Chad Badcock. Chad informed me this is the first in-person talk he's given since before COVID. So, woo, exciting. Right? Yeah, in a room with people. So, um, uh, Chad is an assistant professor in the Department of Forest Resources here at the University of Minnesota. He's been here since 2019 came to us from University of Washington, where he got a PhD in forest science in 2017. And prior to that was at Michigan State in lovely East Lansing, um, where he did both a bachelor's and a master's degree, the bachelor's in forest management and the master's degree jointly in geography and applied statistics. Um, Chad's work, uh, touches on remote sensing, forest inventory, geospatial analysis, and Bayesian statistics. When I took stats like 20 some years ago, the person who taught it was a early Bayesian and every lecture he gave, he said, it's so much easier if we were doing this in Bayesian as opposed to frequentist approaches. <laughs> um, I still am not doing I Bayesian like work, that's so. I've been remembering. Most people don't want to do so. So Chad shared that in uh, his spare time this spring, his favorite spring activity is coaching youth baseball. It's a fun uh, adventure. I've never played baseball, but get me out there and do that. So. All right. So with that, I will pass it over to Chad. And maybe we do a mic. Are you, maybe are you going to come over yeah, here? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. I will get out of your way. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so, yeah, so I've got a presentation here on uh, titled the Forest Carbon Framework, uh, building, earth, uh, building Earth Observation Based Maps of Forest Carbon into Carbon Trading Markets. So uh, most of my work um, to, uh, uh, up to this point has been uh, focused on figuring out how to get remote sensing data or products based off of remote sensing data. So different images or, or photos. Um, or uh, things like that, uh, trying to figure out a way to build these into estimation frameworks to be able to actually uh, figure out how much carbon is in a forest, but then actually get at the uncertainty related to that estimate and uh, in such a way that carbon markets can actually use these things going forward. So a lot of times we see people producing these nice, wonderful maps of forest biomass and carbon, and then, um, and then the kind of everything kind of stops there, and then, uh, and then you get these verification companies that come in and want to potentially use this data, and then they're they're told that you know, well, just use the map instead of collecting field data. But there's a there's a process that goes into actually estimating carbon that involves like calculating standard errors and all those fun things that uh, we taught in Chris Eicher's class. Um, so figuring out how to actually build these sorts of maps and things into those types of estimators is largely what I've been doing in the last four or five years. So you're going to hear a little bit about that. So first, uh, we'll start about um, essentially why we're interested in carbon markets, um, especially in the forestry department. Um, so carbon markets have uh, been developed as a strategy to help mitigate climate change. Um, so they uh, provide a, a type of incentive for companies to potentially purchase credits to offset their carbon emissions. Um, and they can either buy these types of credits from uh, companies that potentially uh, emit less than their uh, particular emissions cap. If they're enrolled in a cap and trade sort of system, a lot like the California Air Resources Board, their uh, compliance network. Um, or they can actually buy these credits um, from projects that are developed that actually sequester carbon from the atmosphere. Um, so, and the big thing for us in the forestry world is that forests can actually be managed or have been claimed to be able to be managed to sequester carbon. Um, so the idea is that a company is emitting carbon and they emit a certain amount and then they go and then they find credits from either forest landowners or other entities to be able to purchase essentially the carbon sequestered from that forest to then offset their emissions. So when companies like Boeing say they're you know net zero carbon emissions, it doesn't mean they're using jet fuel that doesn't emit carbon or anything like that. It just means that they're paying someone some money to sequester carbon on their behalf to offset all of the emissions that they're sending out. 
So this offers a potential revenue source for forest landowners. But um, these carbon, uh, these carbon uh, markets usually require um, quite a bit um, of effort to kind of to get your uh, forest land into the program. Um, and one of those is uh, essentially you need continual continual measurement and monitoring of how much carbon is in that forest and how much is getting stored and sequestered. Um, and then this usually involves third party verification entities who will come in every few years, um, depending on what the market requires, usually seen between five and 10 years to come in and be able to measure the trees on the property and actually figure out how much carbon is actually in there. Um, and then also they usually require some sort of proof of additionality. Um, so that, that is um, basically we need to show that whatever your forest is sequestering isn't something that already would be being sequestered if you didn't, if you weren't in the program which is always a fun, hairy conversation to have with a lot of people. There's a lot of debate over what additionality is and how we should actually be accounting for it. Um, a lot of people are like, well, we could just project that you do the most heavy cutting that you could ever do on your property to make money and say that I'm going to do that, but instead I'm going to enroll in this other program and be able to kind of gather that as an option. But in reality, the landowner maybe wasn't going to harvest the land at all. So that's a fun topic that I do not like to get into because it gets hairy and I don't have any expertise in that sort of um, area anyway. So I like to focus on the measurement and the monitoring of the carbon, trying to reduce costs associated with that. Uh, but then also these carbon markets usually require some sort of long-term long -term commitment um, for uh, essentially for being in the program. So we don't want a forest landowner to Put their property into the program for one year and then get the carbon credits from that then unenroll from the program and then harvest but then you would essentially you weren't storing carbon really at all and essentially giving it all back to the system uh, and re-emitted it as soon as you unenrolled from the program so there's usually some sort of long-term commitment uh california air resources board i think requires you to be in for 50 or 100 years like your property has to be in the program for that long. So you're kind of locked into your management decisions for nearly 100 years if you want to enroll in these types of programs. So these are all different hurdles that, and different challenges that landowners face when they're trying to potentially enter these types of programs. So again, I am focused uh, uh, largely on the measurement and monitoring of carbon part. Uh, this is a very expensive um, thing to uh, to do, especially if you're a small forest landowner. Uh, a lot of times the costs of actually going in and repeatedly inventorying the land uh, can just can be more than the actual income generated from selling the credits on the market, which then kind of leaves these small landowners out of the mix when we're talking about trying to enroll people in these programs. And I'd like to show a fun little video here of a verification company. Do you think that this is gonna work? Uh, on Zoom. Depends if you click share system audio when you share it. Unshare quick. And then... I'll just click on it. And then for those of you online, if you want to watch, it's like two minutes. So you can just copy that link and watch it on your own. Is that cool? Let's see if the audio even works in here. It's not 15 seconds. So you can all get an end. Or it's just not going to work at all. What do I do? Can we hear it in here? Hmm. Nothing. That's cool. I'll just keep on right? Yeah, I can narrate it. Mm -hmm. So these guys are foresters. They're going out and actually trying to, so this is a verification company. Um, and they're actually going into, this is a forest in California. Uh, it's a very large area. Uh, so this is one that is enrolled in the CARB, uh, the California Air Resources Board uh, trading system, uh, carbon system. Yeah, uh, 
CS, SCS Global Services. So this is an independent verifier. So they're going to go into the woods here and actually do traditional forest inventory measurements to go through and try to get a reliable estimate of how much carbon is in the forest. So this is actually the third time that they've entered this forest. Um, so you can see that they are, they usually take very, very detailed measurements to try to figure out how much carbon is actually in the forest. And then he talks about how important it is to have these estimates be very, very reliable and, uh, and repeatable. So they need to be measured uh, consistently. Um, so these are all things we think about when we are setting up traditional forest inventories. And that's essentially what these people are doing here. And then this is how we actually go in and verify these different types of carbon projects. So as you can imagine, this is a pretty expensive ordeal. Um, so to uh, to hire this type of third party crew to go in and you know measure enough plots for a large area, it's going to require quite a bit of effort. So what that means is you need to have a carbon project that's going to sequester and uh, enough carbon to produce enough credits to actually like make the cost of this sort of effort worthwhile. So which party would be paying for the for the, um, uh, the confirmation? My understanding is it's the landowner. Um, or the landowner is paying a different company that is going in and with, who is hiring a verifier to, to handle it on that end. So, but either way, the cost ends up on the landowner at some extent. So no, but I don't, I guess I'm not exactly sure if they directly pay or it depends on what type of program you're in. Either way, this ups the cost of everything. And if you have a small piece of property, this really makes it not worthwhile to enroll in the program often. Okay. All right. So remote sensing is often billed as our great solution to being able to solve this problem. Uh, so, um, so we have uh, government agencies like uh, uh, NASA and uh, U.S. Geological Survey. Um, they are responsible for collecting uh, large amounts of remote sensing information uh, that tends to be highly correlated with uh, what's going on on the ground in our forests. And the hope is that we could use this type of information to, um, to be able to get estimates of how much carbon is in a forest without um, either without going entering the forest physically, like actually sending people into inventory, or at least being able to reduce um, the effort needed to be able to conduct an inventory. So potentially being able to reduce the number of plots that they would need to measure because we can incorporate this type of information. Uh, so this particular one, uh, this is from the European Space Agency. So this is a map of forest uh, volume. So that can be uh, translated to carbon or biomass. Um, and, and this was using uh, different radar sensors. So this one is for, I think it's a 2010 map. Uh, but then also we have uh, uh, different private companies that have uh, that have shown up. So different uh, techno essentially technology based startups. Uh, this is the uh, this is NCX, which uh, many of you have probably heard of. But they produce a project called Base Map, which is a, which is a map of uh, forest carbon or forest biomass um, that could potentially be used to estimate how much uh, how much carbon or biomass is in your forest. And they've made some extraordinary efforts to be able to produce this map, and then uh, with the idea that it would be used in the carbon trading market sort of situation um, to be able to generate estimates with. Uh, out having to actually measure the forest physically or at least reducing the uh, measurements that you would need to do. So there's a lot of these different companies and computer science people coming in and trying to they realize there's a need here to incorporate remote sensing data so we can save money on this and then small landowners can then enroll in these projects because they can go online and just put a little box around their forest and tell them how much carbon is there and then we can just monitor that over time and basically for free. So that is always the pitch that is given. Um, I think what happens usually is that, you know, in remote sensing and computer science, that all sounds wonderful and amazing. But then you talk to someone who does actual forest inventory and they're like, well, what's the standard error? And like, you know, these, these maps are never perfect. 
like uh, we need to be able to, you know, understand that, you know, that they, these estimates aren't necessarily biased or more um, or, uh, highly uncertain. So, and then the machine learning or artificial intelligence type algorithms that they're using to produce these really, really nice maps of biomass make it really, really difficult to go in and actually derive those sorts of statistical properties about these types of estimators. So that is what is still needed. Um, so we need to be able to assess uncertainty with some sort of statistical rigor. Um, so in the way I translate this is we need something similar to a traditional design-based framework that we would use based on you know, probability samples of field plots. We can go in and estimate means and totals. And based on our different sample sizes, we can go in and calculate a standard error or something close to that. And then be able to produce that actual 95% uh, confidence interval or uncertainty interval as I have it labeled here. And then have that uncertainty interval actually, you know, under a repeated sampling scheme, be able to like actually capture the true value, you know, 95% of the time, which then leads us to, you know, we have an uncertainty interval that I say is interpretable. So a lot of times we can produce these types of 95% uncertainty intervals, but if they're not grounded in statistics, then uh, they don't necessarily follow this sort of approach. There's a lot of ways to produce uncertainty intervals using different machine learning algorithms and whatnot, but they don't you're not really producing them in such a way that it actually satisfies this sort of uh, this sort of statement here. So then uh, I'll introduce you to my favorite data set for studying these types of things. Um, so this is Harvard Forest. Uh, it's a 35 hectare stem map. So there's 83,801 trees where they've actually, where I imagine a whole ton of undergraduate and graduate students have been paid to go in and get the location of every single tree within this uh, particular track and measure the diameter of breast height. And uh, for some of them, they actually measured height. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah. So what's nice about this is I actually have something here, a forest where I can actually know how much biomass is as long as I don't, as long as I ignore uncertainty from allometric equations and whatnot, figure out how much biomass is in each tree. But that's something that everyone does. So I don't worry about that part yet. I'll worry about that one later, I think. But There's a, uh, we have a grad student here who went to, uh, who went to school at the school on the periphery of that forest. Uh -huh. Yeah, Andrew's something. No, uh, yeah, I've, I've never been there. Uh, I think uh, my advisor during my master's program, Andrew, Finley, I think he spent some time there with Aaron Weisskettle. I think they hung out at Harvard Forest for a while. That's my only connection, other than knowing that I could download this data set freely and then use it over and over again to kind of prove a bunch of statistical things about my estimators that I'm trying to develop. So I mentioned because I think one of the things he said is he was part of that conscriptive <laughs> labor force. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many trees are in the STEM map at Camp 8, because I know they've They've got one set up up there now, but I don't know if it's uh, quite this size. But they're definitely a huge effort. But for someone like me, they're they're gold. Like I can do I can do a lot um, with a bunch of simulation stuff, like this, which I'll show you here in a minute. Um, so, in addition to having the STEM app completed, um, we also have a bunch of remote sensing data um, collected from Goddard's lidar hyperspectral and thermal imager. So this is a this is a device, uh, this is a combined essentially remote sensing system. So it collects LIDAR and hyperspectral data at the same time. So this thing is equipped and put under a plane and then they fly over the force and collect this data. So, uh, and from this data, I derived yeah, 67 different variables that we could come up with it. So I think there was about 20 or so LIDAR variables. So these are the different relative heights you can take from the point clouds. Um, and then also with the hyperspectral data, you can make an infinite number of possible uh, remote sensing indexes. And uh, there's, I just made a smattering of them. So like there's the near infrared index in there and also like the red edge near infrared index and a whole bunch of other ones that have been claimed in the literature to be useful. So, so then I used, uh, I used a random forest algorithm 
essentially to go in and take these 67 variables and then try to generate a map of, uh, of above ground biomass. And then we're going to use that and we're going to assume that that's our third party biomass product that maybe was given to us and then see if we can figure out a way to use it um, to generate an estimator and see if we can actually estimate biomass with a little bit more certainty than, uh, than using field plots alone, which we can simulate and draw on here. Too. Okay, there's a map of 90th percentile height. So this is, a, this is a proxy for essentially the height of the forest. So you can see there's some sort of really low lying area, potentially a, a swamp. And then we've also got some areas with some tall trees and vegetation and things. And then there's an NDVI, just some samples of the different types of uh, essentially remote sensing data we can produce here. And now we get to get into statistics, which I'm sure is super exciting for everyone. But um, so I'm going to look at three different types of estimators here. So we're going to look at a traditional design based estimator. So essentially, my Y here is the uh, biomass in the particular plot that I'm going to throw down. And then we can divide that by the number of plots we have. And that gives us an estimate of biomass density, as long as I'm sampling the plots using simple random sampling. And then there's an estimator for the standard error that I left off of here that can be derived using that too. And then we can also look at what's been termed a model-assisted estimator. So effectively, it's uh, much like the design-based estimator. It relies on the same kind of probabilistic sampling routines that we do in, design, in the design-based world. What allows us to build in this type of assisting here. Um, so this is just a simple linear regression. So I've got my intercept and a slope. And then my X1 here is that for, is that a random forest uh, predictions of biomass there. So essentially we're building this model and relating it to the actual observations of biomass. And then uh, and then summing those up, summing up all the predictions, dividing it by the number of pixels in the area. And then we have this uh, this. Uh, essentially, it's a bias correction term where we take the sum of the or the mean and the residuals and then add it to that estimate. Granted, the way I estimate these parameters, this thing is essentially zero all the time anyway. But if we got creative and tried to get areas for subsets, we could get those bias corrections in there. And then we can jump into our model based approach. So, this is a geostatistical model, and then I'm going to fit this using Bayesian inference. So, which means I'm just using a different approach to estimate my parameters than we typically do in a frequentist setting. And I'll leave it at that. Um, but yeah, so uh, the big important part um, of this model is that I have a thing called a spatial random effect in here. And this thing is designed to be able to absorb any extra spatial autocorrelation that's a, that exists in the residuals of the model um, to hopefully return us to some of our fairly strict model-based assumptions that we have to follow to actually be able to get a usable estimate out of this. And then this is just a fun way of saying that I'm going to get this posterior distribution for the entire forest area, and I can take the median of that, and that works as my best estimate. And I can actually take the standard deviation of this posterior distribution, and that thing ends up looking a lot like a standard error that we produce in design-based statistics, as long as we're able to adhere for the most part to the assumptions we need to assume uh, for this particular model. So these are my approaches. Um, usually the design-based and the model-assisted approach, it's fairly, they're, they tend to be fairly standard, and um, we should expect those things to have very nice intervals. This is the big question mark, is that we, if we can move into this particular model-based approach, there's a lot of flexibility that we gain if we can move into this type of approach but we really have to see if it actually works um, in our setting before we can do that. So I'm gonna do a, what's called a repeated sampling study. Um, so I'm gonna draw a simple random sample of N plots over top of my forest. Uh, I'm gonna estimate uh, biomass density and uncertainty uh, for the entire Harvard forest uh, using those particular plots. And then I'm gonna repeat those two things 10,000 times. So I'm gonna take 10,000 plots each, or I'm gonna take N plots 10,000 times, calculate 10,000 estimates of uh, biomass density and uncertainty. And then using those 10,000 estimates, I can see if my uh, coverage probabilities come out. Um, so yeah, but then I'm gonna do this for a range of sample sizes. Um, and then we can use all of this wonderful simulated sampling stuff 
to, uh, to essentially assess bias. So see if on average we're estimating true value um, or if on average we're estimating too high or too low, hopefully we're estimating the true value. Um, and then we can see if the mean of the standard errors, um, uh, see how that changes as we increase sample size. So you can see the relationship between sample size and uncertainty. And then we can also check and see if my 95% uncertainty intervals that I'm creating each time actually contain the true value 95% of the time. So here's my design-based estimator. So this is the average of those 10,000 estimates at sample size 25. And then you can see that it's fairly consistent all the way through. Um, and then this is actually true value here. So after looking at that, I argue that there's a seems to be, this estimator seems to be unbiased and hopefully it is because it's designed to be that way. Um, and then we also have our standard errors here. So what we can see is that our standard error seems to go down as sample size goes up, which totally makes sense. That should be what's happening. And then we can look at my 95% coverage probabilities here. And hopefully these things are all pretty close to 95. So yeah, we're, all, we're all very close to 0.95 here. So. You can uh, rest assured that I programmed the design-based estimator correctly and that everything is working out nicely. And then we can move over to the model-assisted estimator. So this is the one where we're still design-based in theory, but we can actually incorporate that remote sensing. And then you can see that my estimates still appear to be fairly unbiased and that my coverage probabilities, aside from this one, appears to be just parallel. Um, they are all kind of revolving around that 95%, which is telling us that this particular type of estimator in conjunction with a simple random sampling design could potentially be a useful way of bringing in remote sensing data. So one thing I would like to check is to see if our standard errors are actually lower, if we're actually including that data versus not. And I didn't actually make a figure for that, so we can kind of bounce back and forth. Uh, so you can see at 200, we're around 10 for that standard error. The smaller standard error is, the more uh, confident we are in our estimate. We can see we get that down to about eight or so. I'd like to point out that the uh, the assisting model in here, the R squared for that thing is about 0.38. So this is a very weak relationship between the actual plot data and the map. Um, we would see hopefully a lot more, uh, much more reduction in our standard errors if we actually had a map that was uh, that better fit the data we have. Um, but even with a low standard error like that, I mean, even with a low R squared like so, we're still seeing those sorts of improvements here. And on to my Bayesian spatial model, the geostatistical model-based estimator. So this one takes a heck of a lot longer to run. Uh, my caveat here is uh, between yesterday and just before this presentation, I managed to get through 100 repeated samples, not 10,000, and then I skipped over 75, 75. So these numbers are much more rough than the other numbers. Um, in a couple of days, I'll be able to tell you, the, tell you the real values. But even with only 100 samples, I'm still not seeing anything here that tells me that something's extremely wrong. Um, you know, we still are hitting in that 95% realm, and we seem to be there's someone in bias here. So we have a few estimates that are a little high and a few estimates that are a little low. Um, and as we increase the number of repeated samples, those things will uh, will stabilize as they go. But interesting things. Uh, so you notice that I changed standard error to standard deviation here. So this is a, this is a terminology situation when we start moving between frequent distance Bayesian statistics. So instead of calling things standard errors, we call them posterior standard deviations. And, um, but they end up kind of having the same sort of, uh, same sort of interpretation in a sense. But what's nice is you can see, so we can kind of bounce back and forth again. So we have an 8.25 on 200. And then for the model assisted estimator, we're coming out at 8.26. What I've noticed comparing these two estimators um, in other areas is that they produce very similar estimates typically as long as we do a good job of fitting our bond based uh, our model in uh, our geostat model. So, cool. So some conclusions from this wonderful study. Um, so incorporating remote sensing produced uh, biomass maps um, do seem to be able to reduce standard errors. 
or the posterior standard deviations. Um, and we've noticed that the model assisted and the geostatistical model based estimator produce, um, they appear to produce useful uncertainty estimates. And by useful, I mean they're actually producing a 95% confidence interval we can interpret. Um, and then also the model assisted and geostatistical model seem to produce um, fairly, at least in this setting, uh, equally well um, estimates. So, meaning that the, the uncertainty with the estimate coming from the model assisted or the geostatistical model, they appear to be um, pretty similar. So no one's, neither one of them is really winning out here um, in this setting. Um, there are other reasons why I think the geostat model will be more useful um, in the long run. And we will get into that here. All right, I've shown a few people this over the past couple of years, but it's super cool. So I like to show it up. And with that whole explanation, maybe it'll make more sense to some people. If I can zoom in, you guys can see it. So this is Cloquet Forestry Center. Let me zoom out and kind of see where it is there. Come back in. So, and this is a map of above ground biomass. Um, I used the statewide uh, LIDAR collection for the area um, uh, to, uh, to build the model. Um, but you could easily imagine this as some other biomass, you know, map that we could have used as a covariate in that particular geostatistical model that we're looking at. So, and then these are all the best predictions for each one of those 25 meter by 25 meter pixels uh, based on that geostatistical model. And then here is the 400 or so field plots that were used to help build that model. So it's great. We have this nice little map of predictions, but it's a heck of a lot more than just a map. Um, so this little icon over here allows me to go in and essentially draw this fun little box over top of all of Cloquet. And then I wait a second, and then it produces this little figure on the side. So essentially, this is my posterior projected distribution of above ground biomass for the entire Colgate Forest Reserve. So our best estimate would be essentially the highest density estimate there, the, the mean of this whole thing. Um, we get a 21.49 megagrams per hectare. And then to produce my 95% uncertainty interval, I essentially take a quantile interval over this posterior predicted distribution, and I can produce an insert, uh, a 95% uncertainty interval. So it's between 20.69 and 22.29. So the idea here is that if we can produce a map in such a way, essentially over all of Minnesota, we could actually produce this thing, get it up online, and allow landowners to be able to draw boxes around their property, come up with esti initial estimates, and actually come up with uncertainties that we can use. Why 25 meters? Uh, that's the size of the plot. Based on, oh, okay. That's the, I wanted it to be coincident with the plot size there. And since I didn't have anything but the LiDAR data, I could hit it exactly, so I grabbed 25. But in reality, I think we'd be looking at 30 meters because we're likely going to use a lot of Landsat data and things like that when we start doing scanned out. But yeah, that's why I was, that's the only reason why I was 25. But yeah, so it's fun. So we can actually go in and do this for different subsets. So I think. I imagine that this would be camp eight here. Then we get another estimate. So we're at 54.99. Uh, it's hard to tell, but our interval is a little wider here because we're trying to estimate biomass for a much smaller area. So it's going to be easier to get a biomass density for a much larger area than a very small area. Um, and the way that this is calculated here, it actually reflects that in the uncertainty it's and then you could actually get down to a pixel level and actually map uncertainties at a pixel level. If you were to use NAEP and LIDAR, does this perform the same at a one meter cell size? I haven't tried. Um, I would worry about going to a one meter, one meter size because everything would have to get calibrated using that 25 meter diameter or 25 meter area plot. Um, yeah, I, I worry about scaling between between things that way. Um, that can violate some of the assumptions hitting the model, and then it would mess up my intervals, essentially. But what are we doing on time here? 410. You guys want to hear more? 
What's a megagram? A megagram? Um, it is an amount of biomass. <laughs> There's a lot of grams. <laughs> it's a it's 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 a mega amount of grams. <laughs> I have no idea. But um, it's a standard unit of measurement. Okay. Um, <laughs> internationally. See, sometimes I sit in front of the computer so much that it just becomes numbers to me, and I get busted on those sorts of things. Well, <laughs> it's just like I'm so far into other things that it's like, oh, yeah, what were the units? No. But um, yeah. Yeah, it's a standard unit of measurement. And uh, what's nice it's with this, since we have access to this full posterior distribution, it's very easy to convert between units afterwards. So because I have a bunch of samples, I can convert these samples. There's actually other fun features that we have too um, when we use this type of model in, the, in a Bayesian framework. So often when we want to model biomass, biomass isn't directly, isn't linearly related to essentially forest height. So oftentimes we like to do some sort of transformation on the plot measurements of biomass. I always use a square root transformation because that seems to fix some of my problems. Um, if you do this type of model in a frequentist setting though, the actual back transformation process afterwards introduces this bias into the model and stats people will yell at you as soon as you do it. But if you move over to a Bayesian approach, you have access to this full posterior distribution. So instead of, instead of just like, essentially in frequent this world, you have the mean and then the interval. Here, I basically have, what I like to say is everything. And then, um, and then I have, basically I can back transform the entire distribution and then take my mean and then take my interval and then actually takes care of that bias problem. So there's some other little tweaks about being a Bayesian that save me from a few headaches that I get to explain in my reviews that come back from my papers all the time. About 2,200 pounds. A ton? It's a ton. So it's probably it's metric, metric tons. I think it's metric tons, megagrams, or... There's a lot of different ways they say it. So is there is there some sort of known conversion, you know, how much one ton of biomass can how many tons of carbon that can sequester or a portion of uh, the magic number is to divide it by two. Which is why I always talk about biomass and carbon interchangeably, because I know it's just like, oh well, you just divide it by two. It's all modeled output at that point too. So, but those are all the uncertainties and stuff we still get to ignore for a while. So someone yells loud enough for to tell us to work on it, which will be soon. But it's a very that would be a very difficult problem. So all right. Chris, are we in the question section? <laughs> sure. I mean, I've got yeah, I love it. Let's talk. So <laughs> you just kind of stepped over the rock of my question, which is the very beginning. You just went above ground. You just went above ground. But talk to me about below ground and why we don't care about it or why we are not working on it now. Or below ground carbon is a heck of a lot harder to measure using above ground remote sensing instruments. And also it's harder to measure actually physically. Yeah. yeah. So that's a fun thing that um that is something that um, I've been working on at least a little bit and plan to more so. So figuring out how to model all the carbon pools. Right now we're just focused on above ground forest carbon, but you know, there's many other pools that we need to be worried about as well. Um, so there's a way to extend these types of models um, into essentially a multivariate setting um, where essentially we're able to simultaneously predict above ground carbon and below ground carbon. As the uh, the U.S. Forest Service uh, on some of their forest inventory analysis plots actually collects uh, below ground carbon, um, but only on a subset of their plots. But that's okay because the type of model we use here it can handle that sort of missingness, so we can bring in those much far fewer below ground carbon measurements and actually be able to write a model that would simultaneously predict both of them and try and try to preserve the correlation between those two. So what's going on above ground is at least going to be somewhat correlated with what's going on below ground. And we can leverage that type of information to hopefully produce better estimates of below ground carbon. 
Yeah. That's the stats dodo question. So you basically showed that you were getting the right answer with 25 and 200 samples, and there's mm -hmm. just the uncertainty. Yep. Like, why do we care about bigger or smaller uncertainty if you're getting the right number with um, a smaller sample? So those estimates I was showing are, yes, if we did, <clears throat> yeah. So these, uh, yeah, these estimates are the average, it's the average of the 10,000 different samples of 25 that I took. Oh, got it. So <laughs> what we would hope is that after we did it 10,000 times, there were just as many of them would be above the true answer as below the true answer, which gives us an unbiased estimate. So, which is why these numbers hitting it so nicely. Yeah, clearly, well, we, we just hit the right answer all the time, but that would actually be a, a crazy amount of oversampling. But yeah, so we're interested in the uncertainty because we know we're going to either be above it or below it. And we need to kind of know how much, how yeah. much we I might be above that. and below. Yeah. About that. He's now playing beats. <laughs> but yeah. Um, can I show you a couple other things? What time do we have? 417. Okay. Any online edition? Um well, fun fact about Forrest Fleischman grew up near the Harvard Forest. Oh. Did he measure those trees? Uh, unknown. <laughs> Kyle Kyle Gill says, FYI, on uh, our camp, eight stem map plots are two acres each. One has about 170 trees greater than five inch DPH, and the other has 518. Nice. Well, so it's a lot smaller than forest plot, but for Harvard. And Dean has his hand raised, but I think with the sound, I'm not sure we could get the questions I've asked to, to transfer it to the chat, but that's all that's going on. Cool. Okay, so just real quick, um, extending the geostat model to the state of Oregon. So starting to think a little bit bigger. Um, essentially, we had a map of forest biomass that was produced using a conglomeration of random forest models. Um, and then uh, they produced this wonderful map of biomass here. And then we're going to try to recalibrate this thing, bringing in uh, U.S. Forest Service forest inventory analysis data, and then try to estimate, um, to get estimates for the state with some sort of uncertainty. And then we did that here. So I've got my orange one is the design-based estimate, like we were looking at. And then I have a model-assisted estimator, which is the purple one. And then here I have a spatial, but the pink one here is the geostat model. So we've got an estimate um, from 2001 to 2016. And this little green dot is essentially just taking the mean of the map predictions. So if we didn't use any plot data at all, and we just assumed the map was, was fine, we would get these sort of estimates out of it. But we can see that there's, they're always a heck of a lot higher than our design-based estimate is giving us, which is a cause for concern. Uh, but we can see that our two approaches that bring in and actually use this map to help in the, uh, help in the estimation process we essentially kind of remove that sort of bias and kind of get us in a realm where it looks more like the design-based estimates. Um, and then these are my 95% uncertainty intervals. You can see that they tend to be a little bit narrower than design-based the design-based ones, but um, not, I would say not substantially. Um, at a state level, it may not be worthwhile to actually bring this data in because we have seven or 800 plots for the state every year. We're honing in on that estimate pretty well at this point anyway, at least at this scale. But we can move down to the county scales and we can start to see how we start to um, essentially decrease our uncertainty as we start bringing in these other approaches. And then we have one with even smaller sample sizes. You, know, you can't read them up there, but they're around, they range between 15 and 30 plots in this particular county per year. You can see that our design best estimates are really, really in certain these um, very large. Um, we can see that our other ones are our model assistance bringing down a little bit, but our geostatistical model seems to be bringing it down quite a bit. Um, and I argue that that's happening because the geostat model 
has a very nice way of being able to borrow strength from neighboring counties uh, to help inform the prediction uh, within the county. So it's able to leverage information that we have going on other places in the state of Oregon to be able to help inform our estimate there. The way that spatial random effect works, it's able to kind of get that proximate data to bring in and help inform things. And then we can go for real small sample sizes. Um, so these are like below, these are all below 10. You can see that a lot of times in a confidence interval will be even including zero. So there may not be any biomass there at all. But in 2007, they didn't actually measure any plots. We can't actually generate estimates using the design-based model system approach, but we can generate an estimate using our model, our geostat model. This is a different approach to make it. Yeah. Yeah. So Chad, is this these are all for Austin? Do they then motivate your thought for carbon markets, especially for say a smaller landowner? They would argue for spatial model-based, right? To help. Yeah. So because you know, even at a county level here, well, I mean, even at a you know, at these small sample sizes, we can still generate estimates of estimates with a fairly high amount of confidence. Is there any ground truthing that comes into that spatial based model, or is this arguing for strictly all remote work? Um, so this is um, this is using uh, FIA data. So it's actually uh, to be able to fit the model. So if we're using FIA data to calibrate the thing, we're still using that FIA information, even if there isn't an FIA plot within your forest. But it's still helping fit that model. Um, but uh, another thing that's nice, and another thing we've been working on with this forest carbon framework idea, is that you know we could produce an initial map using this approach using FIA data, and essentially we get a gauge of our uncertainty, and then based on the requirements of the particular carbon market, you can actually figure out how many plots you might actually need to put into your forest to be able to get to a like a level of uncertainty that we can accept. So being able to, you know, have that initial estimate using all this publicly available data for your particular forest, it's like, well, it's still a little too high. Maybe if we threw 10 or 15 plots in there, we could kind of hone in on things a little bit. And there's a staging process that we can use with this type of model to kind of continue to add stuff in. Yeah. I got a note from Dean. Hey, Dean. Dean says, thanks, Chad. NCX seems to have come up with a way to provide landowners with one-year contracts and uses a combination of remote sensing and field plots that is accepted by the markets. Do you know much about their modeling and how accurate it is? Um, I know as much as essentially they're willing to tell us. And I guess my understanding is also that their protocol didn't get accepted by Vera. So Vera was the verification company that they sent it out for public review and it did not get accepted based on what they were, essentially how they were trying to calculate that estimate of uncertainty. So. <laughs> now, regarding the marketplace and yeah. one-year contracts, I guess I'm sort of ignorant on, on this whole thing. Um, to use your example of, of Boeing, uh, mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. Boeing offsets a bazillion tons of carbon a year. Mm -hmm. Let's say they're doing it via this program. Yep. Let's say there's one landowner that can provide all that capacity for them. Right? Mm -hmm. And so in 2023, Boeing pays that landowner to offset, you know, yep. the carbon credits offset all that. Mm -hmm. What happens next year? I mean, this guy's capacity is only X plus one yep. to store carbon. Does yep. he get paid every year of, of, or only an incremental amount more? And if so, what's the, you know, how is he incentivized to stay in for a hundred years? Or? Yeah, well, well, you get paid based on the, so in those annual sort of settings that they've been proposing, you would get paid based on how much carbon you accrued above what you had the last year. So whatever your forest changed. Um, but yeah, so like as like if you have a, an old growth stand or something, and then it kind of plateaus. It's not really sequestering much more carbon. Like there isn't much incentive to stay in there, other than you have to, because you, you know, you signed away essentially your forest to be able to store that carbon at least for a hundred or so years. Um, 
I mean, but I guess is, is the is the model is you have this one big payout when you get your you know trees into the program, but then since your capacity only incrementally increases year on year, I, then I, I don't think you like, usually get a big payout um, based on your initial measurement. That just sets your baseline. So then over in the next five years, they're going to measure again and they're going to see how much you accrued based on the what you had at the beginning. And then it just kind of monitors your and then approval and then you're able to sell that agreement. Um, but then there's also like situations where you can propose to do management activities on your forest where, you know, well, it's like, you know, you'll accrue carbon for a little while and then you do a harvest and then you'll use it and try to build it back and harvest and kind of do these things. And I, I don't think it's been explained that way to me before where it's like, you're throwing carbon and you do a harvest, accrue, Harvest through an harvest. Ideally, you try to keep your trees in, in this maximum carbon capture zone. Yeah, so this would be like, and this is like imagining this is the way to make the most money over 100 years. But then you can say, well, I could do that, but if I don't do that, I can probably accrue our carbon like this. And then all of this essentially is your credits you can sell. Okay. That's how it's been explained to me before. But you can also think about potentially being able to delay your harvest. Um, there's different sorts of strategies in the management world that you could potentially use to kind of figure out ways to do it. And yeah, it's, it's hairy stuff though. <laughs> yeah. Do, do any of the models factor in for decay or is the assumption that we have solid trees all the way through? Um, by model, what do you well, mean? Or is the assumption that you have solid trees, or it, I mean, I could imagine you have like heartwood rot, where you have a tree that's you know this big, but it's got a foot hollow in this inside. Um, yes, there are quite a few things to go, to go into actually producing this particular type of graph, and it all involves adjustments, um, based on um, things you're talking about. Um, essentially to kind of adjust those carbon estimates. The maps I'm making here are not acknowledging that at all. Um, but you could admit, you know, like, I always imagine that these are where we're going to get those baseline estimates from. And then we can actually get, and then, um, you know, we only have to enter the forest every five years of plot data. We can at least get an estimate on an annual increment of how much might be accruing. And then we can get that corrected when they go in and actually do the verification. This is just a fun plot showing my uncertainty interval width for all of my county predictions for every year. So each dot is the width of the uncertainty interval. Um, for my green ones are the design-based ones, orange are the model-assisted, and the purple is the geostatistical model. So you see when we get sample sizes in the range of you know between 80 and 95 is the max amount we have for the counties. The estimates all do very similarly, but as we reduce that sample size, we start to see that the model base approach starts to win out, which is showing us that we can potentially use this type of model when we don't have a lot of field data and still hopefully get reliable estimates. That was my last take home. I think then a bunch of work. Thank you for that. Yeah. So on the Harvard Forest, the the standard errors on the um, design based mm -hmm. follow the form. If you you went from fifty to two hundred, yep. you increase the sample size by four. It reduced your standard error by half. Mm -hmm. Fully understandable. I was curious. I was. I thought it was really interesting that all that pattern also held for the design uh, model assisted, and then your your geostatistical model. Yep. I mean, is there a divide by the square root of n in those calculations too? Like there is there is the design base. It is definitely not in the model based stuff. Yeah. Um, but there are like it's a really hard argument to make about like the sort of the sort of equivalencies I see between the two. Mm -hmm. Um and because they're just they exist in different paradigms of statistics, I don't think there's ever gonna be a solid argument for like why they make sense that they're coming out together. I just keep seeing it and then having arguments with some people about things. And then <laughs> is, there, a, 
But yeah. Is there a role for the federal government to make the official map? I would love it carbon? if the federal government would make the official map. So is the what's what's your familiarity with the big map program? And are they I know a little bit about doing it doing that? Um yeah, but they're not producing their map in such a way that they can produce uncertainty intervals, I don't think. I think they may be. Um, okay, but it, build up behaviors neighbor Okay, can they get it? Like, I, I'm I not that familiar. I don't, I don't know if we can get it for air. Like, a lot of people focus like, well, yeah, we can get that uncertainty interval for that particular pixel, yeah. but at the end of the day, we don't really care about the pixel. We care about the whole forest. And yeah, I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sure they have uncertainty of these all pixels. Okay, so not total. Problem. And they generate tree lists for each one of those pixels, and that's how they're able to like pass them through FDS and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm on a project that's there's another part where we're trying to do that produce tree lists. It's not me, but David Bell and and Matt Gregory and company over in Oregon. They're okay. trying to take my output and use it to make tree lists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. How about the U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, do they have control over the carbon market? Because in Mexico, they, you know, they don't just let anybody decide to sell carbon. There's a certain amount of carbon they want to keep for themselves and all that relationship and negotiation. Right? So that they don't. Um, the, the only like regulatory market that I know of in the U.S. is the California Air Resources Board. So that's the only one that's like really. They keep their carbon in well they just run their system over they just they run it at a government level over there where the rest of the markets are voluntary markets so you can enter into this as a company basically just so you can advertise that you're you know trying to be net zero um and, um, and those sorts of things but yeah there's not like a big overarching like government setup for this kind of carbon trading system no, not even that. Mexico says if we can't sell carbon, we want to be selected to offset our carbon. Okay. And so that. So they're trying to be net zero as a government. So they're using they want to capitalize on carbon seconds. Yeah. Okay. Like Interesting. Not sell it, period. Well, that's forced on private land. Yes. Um, now, have we just put a, a new mission on orbit just recently that's focused on measuring forest carbon? Um, I, I think something has just gone up within like the last month or something. I know that ESA has been putting up different instruments to be able to directly, well, directly yeah, may, may not be a NASA mission. But I, um, I, I couldn't tell you a name, but it sounds familiar. Um, but that's a. He's, Maps are produced all the time, it seems like. like we always get a particular map. Um, and then, uh, and then, but being able to generate estimates from it is the challenge, I think. So. Cool. Uh, respect everyone's time, so. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks. Let's thank Chad and for everyone who's still around and online. Next week, we have Dr. Chris Edgar, who will be um, talking in this series. And we also have a bioeconomy job candidate in the latter part of the week. So Chris will be during this time slot next week. And the bioeconomy candidate, I can believe, is Thursday and Friday will be the interview days. <laughs>